Hopefully you watched our main video on a new recipe for pie, this formula here. This accompanying video features an explanation of the physics paper which almost serendipitously gave rise to the discovery. And the paper isn't even about this, <laughs> okay? This is the important thing to remember. The paper's got nothing to do with it. This is just a little quirky aside that they stumbled across. The paper's about string theory, okay? So should we tell you what the paper's actually about? Yeah. Okay? So you remember when we did, we did a video on 60 symbols once upon a time about the, I think we called it the case for string theory. Do you remember? Yes. Out pop strings. It's not like you try strings out pop strings. Yeah, so, so it's kind of related to what we discussed there. So very roughly, if you think about particles, right? If you think about particles sort of smashing into each other, it's what we do when we do particle physics, we smash particles into each other. So we have two particles coming in and they smash and the two particles going out. Now we describe those processes in particle physics with something called an amplitude. It's just a, a number which kind of tells us something about the probability that the particles will scatter through a certain angle or do whatever, right? And, you know, those amplitudes sort of, they, they shouldn't really exceed one, but you can have occasional spikes in the amplitude. And what does it mean to have a spike in the amplitude at some particular energy? That means you've created a new particle. So your scattering process is, is triggering the, you know, the creation of a new particle. Maybe that particle then decays and, and, then, and then you produce the output of the scattering process. So whenever, you know, so we see this at the LHC, you know, there's the spikes in the amplitude as you produce the Higgs particle, for example. So whenever there's a spike in the amplitude, that's, that's that manifesting a new particle. Now in string theory, we have these string theory amplitudes, which we talked about in that video, which have really nice properties and, particularly that they well behaved at high energies. Nothing goes wrong at high energies. They're really, really nice. And they do nice things at low energies, or to, or to leading order anyway. But, there is a but, is that up until now, we didn't really know how to capture the low energy behavior of these amplitudes in full, sort of beyond leading order. So what do I mean by that? So we know that in string theory you have you might have massless particles, and then there's the high, these correspond to the lighter states of a string, and then you can have the excited states of the string, okay, which correspond to heavier particles. And those should show up as spikes in the amplitude. But you want to capture the physics of those spikes, and so you want to see, what you want to do is to say, below a certain energy scale, can I capture the physics of all the spikes that should appear below that energy scale? And up until now, you couldn't really do that. And the question was it, was, it was really an issue of trying to understand sort of expansions and, and truncations of these, of, of sort of these kind of series, like the kind that we've been looking at here. Actually, they're ones that involve the, the, what's called the Euler beta function, but that takes the value of pi in some places, which is how this, this arose. So we haven't been able to do this until, until this paper. And this paper figured out how to do it, right? It's, it's interesting because I think, you know, you might have wondered why couldn't we do it? And it might, you might have thought, well, maybe it's because in string theory, sometimes high energy stuff sort of mixes with low energy stuff in kind of weird and wonderful ways. And maybe we shouldn't be able to do this thing. But actually, these guys have shown that you can. And that they've shown that using these clever new expansions, they can say, look, this is what the theory should look like up until this scale. You're capturing all the physics you expect to be beneath that scale in the right way. And... And so, so, so string theory really, in some limit, is behaving like an ordinary quantum field theory. And this is really useful because what it means is, is that when we go to the LHC now, and we're scattering hadrons, we're smashing particles together, we can say a bit more about what string theory should be expected to predict once it starts to tickle the effects of these higher stringy states. So it's really useful in that respect. And that's why it's an interesting paper. And that's why we actually invited these guys to come and give a seminar here. Uh, long before we'd even noticed the hoo-ha about pi, but it came, they gave a wonderful seminar. And later, all the fuss about pi emerged. It seems like there was a certain collision, a certain type of particle energy interaction thing going on that maps onto pi. And therefore, they were coming up with this particular summation. So what it is, is, is that there's something in string theory called the Veneziano amplitude, which is the first amplitude of string theory that was ever written down. And it was, it was used to describe the scattering of two particles called a pion, and then them scattering into a pion and an omega particle, right? And that amplitude, that formula, that mathematical formula, depends on something called the Euler beta function. Okay, so the Euler beta function, which we might write as b x y, is basically a combination of what's these gamma functions, 
And gamma functions are basically the generalization of factorials. When they're integer values, they're factorials. So if a gamma of an integer n would be n minus 1 factorial. But this, the, the idea of the gamma function is you extend its definition to general complex numbers. Anyway, these amplitudes, this Veneziano amplitude, which describes scattering of certain states and string theory, depends on this beta function, this, this, this Euler beta function. And it's really beautiful. It has all the right, exactly the right properties you want it to have. But why, where does pi come into the game? Well, so they were messing, so these authors, these Sinyu and Sang, were messing about with the beta function, trying to find representations of, of the beta function. But it just so happens that at certain values, the beta function gives pi. If you evaluate it at, at a half, a half at this point, it, that is pi. <laughs> so they got their representation of the, of the beta functions for, and they were applying this to string theory and, doing, and looking at it at general points, but they knew that actually, if we evaluate this at a half, we'll get pi and we'll get a new representation for pi. But was, they actually did it for also some of the Riemann zeta functions as well. They got new representations for that. Again, just relating it to known values of the beta function at certain points. But they weren't really, the paper is not about that. It's about trying to understand string theory and, and the low energy behavior, or at least the field theory limit of string theory. And was it a good paper in that respect? I, I really liked it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's published in PRL, which is, 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 is a really good journal. You know, it's not easy to get in. As I said, when, I, when it came out, uh, we, we, we invited them, partly because I've been getting more and more interested in trying to understand the field theory limit of string theory. And this, this was obviously a, a work which was related to that. Yeah, and, and but just this random pie thing also came along for the ride. <laughs> if you'd like to see an interview I did with the authors of the paper, Arnab Sahar and Aninda Sinha, there should be a link on screen and in the video description. Has it given you more motivation? Has it, give, does it, has it put a fire in you to think, I want to write more papers that get this level of attention. Uh, honestly, this attention is not what uh, I crave for. Uh, the, the, it's the joy of working things and learning new things and that gives me more motivated. So yeah, I've got to look for attention as well.